Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Um, the greatest of the British men, uh, one of the two, the other was William Shakespeare, I suppose, uh, Sir, uh, Sir Isaac, Sir Isaac Newton, um, has given us an extraordinary tool for dealing with, uh, uh, with reality. Uh, we still use Newton equations for building bridges and uh, uh, air plants and everything else. Um, but especially has given us a vision of what is real, what is reality, a way of thinking about reality, which in fact uh, it's at the basis of his equation, and which is unbelievably simple and beautiful and convincing and we all already sort of have in our mind, which is the following. There is a huge empty space, right? Uh, which has no special direction, up or down, they're all the same, it's uh, the same all over. And so this is, a, this is sort of a tablet which is supposed to represent the space. So it's equal and goes for all over for infinity. Okay? So that's the stage. And uh, on this stage, uh, time passes for this space, time. Time passes, equal since ever, forever. And all the thing we see uh, can just be thought as bodies or particles move around. And they move straight in space forever um, until something uh, pushes or pulls them, forces, Newton forces. And uh, these forces are generated by nothing else but other particles. So that's it. Um, space, times, and particles. And this is really fantastic and phenomenal if you think, because uh, the enormous complexity of everything we see, uh, Newton asks us to think that it can be reduced to just space, time, and particles, and nothing else. Now, his idea, of course, is the idea, of course, is not completely uh, he, uh, new. Uh, Newton recognized that he took it from ancient thinkers, uh, from the ancient atomists, uh, and Democritus in particular. Uh, but Newton was able to transform it uh, using mathematics, using experiments, using transform it into a uh, extraordinarily powerful uh, general picture of reality, which we can actually use. And uh, almost all our modern world world has been uh, based uh, into into it. Unfortunately, the books of Democritus are all lost. Um, our civilization has the uh, misfortune. We, we have all of Aristotle and, and none of Democritus. Uh, we only know him through some, some uh, indirect sources, and it's from indirect sources that Newton got this picture. This picture is fantastic, but science is not about <coughs> discovering how reality is. It's discovering how reality is, and then discovering more, and then more, and then more, and uh, looking farther and farther. And in fact, this picture turns out to be incomplete, inexact, approximate, and what I want to give you in a half an hour or less is a story of how this picture has changed and still changed. So the first change, it will be in uh, three or four steps. The first change is still a British man, in fact two British men, um, a wealthy Scottish and a poor working class Englishman, which are Michael Faraday, the, the poor Englishman, and uh, Sir uh, uh, James uh, Clerk Max. And they um, realize, they, they change this picture a little bit. And uh, how, um, when particles attract one another, um, it's not really that there is something mysterious going from here to here, but there is something in between, which is electric field, electric field and magnetic field. So what is the electric field and the magnetic field? Well, it's something which is all over. It's something that in which we are immersed. Uh, so let me just represent it. It's a nice, another piece of fabric. And uh, when uh, a particle attracts one another, what it's really doing is sort of pulling and pushing the field, which in turn pulls and push the particles. Uh, and Maxwell writes the equations for the field, how these things move. And uh, so uh, there is a, the, the, the beautiful world's world of, of Newton has changed now. It's not just space and time and particles, but the space, time, particles, and the field. And it's a huge triumph. I mean, all the equations of electromagnetism that we use, all our technologies based on macro equations, but it's much more than that. First of all, as I believe all you know, Newton realizes that the vibrations of the field, the field vibrate, moves, is light, right? So light is just a field uh, that rapidly vibrates. 
which means that uh, if your teacher told you that you cannot see the fields, uh, is obviously false. We see only the fields, right? Because we see light. I, I don't see you, I see the light that comes from you, the molecules of your body vibrate and the, the field vibrate and lights come to my eyes and that's how I know you're there. So I only see the yellow here, the, the field. Uh, physics is beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> so, um, so this vibrate, but that's not enough. Uh, Maxwell realized that behind, uh, besides the, the fast vibration of the field, there are also slow vibrations. And he said, well, you can produce it with antennas and stuff. And in fact, they were found later on. And these are the uh, radio waves uh, with which we have radio, TV, communication. So all modern communication technology is based on an object, the, the radio waves, the, the moving of the field that was not discovered, was uh, understood to exist before detecting it by, by, by Maxwell. This is the power of theoretical physics. So here we are. It's a um, new world. This is the Newton plus uh, the electric fields. But then just a few decades later, this changes again. And this time it's not British, sorry, it's German, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and the, and, and, and the Ger what does a German do? Well, the German realized um, uh, that his name is Einstein, Albert Einstein. Um, he realized that if, if uh, things attract one another, they also attract, of course, as everybody knew, gravitationally, like this is the sun, this is the earth, it pulls it. So there should be also a gravitational field. So there should be another field, right? Not just uh, the dominating field, but a gravitational field. Now, if Einstein had only added another field, he would have been a great, f good physicist, but not the genius he is. So why he was a genius? Because he understood something else. And what he understood is that there is indeed a gravitational field. Uh, let me put this aside, because otherwise I get confused with why I don't have so many hands. But this gravitational field um, is already in the picture and is Newton's space. So what I understood is that Newton's space is not such a rigid object like this thing pretending to be a tablet. It. So let me take away the rigidity. It's a field itself, which can also move and be squeezed and uh, make waves uh, and be stretched and be pulled, uh, like the electric field. It's exactly the same thing. Um, and uh, to the extent in which it remains still is Newtonian space. So Newtonian space is nothing else than the, 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 the gravitational field uh, when we disregard the fact that it's moving. In other words, the space in which we live, uh, this flat, uniform, still thing, the stage uh, that Newton imagined, is not at all a flat, fixed uh, stage, it's something moving. We're not living on a stage, we're living on some oscillating thing which can be bent and can be uh, pulled and stretched, and there are waves, which are the gravitational waves, which we now indirectly detect. Um, there are curvature, there's curvature space, this curvature can be so big that it could, you can make a hole, and that's black holes, and so on and so forth. It's not just space that curves, I've been cutting short uh, the angles here a little bit, it's space-time. So it's not just the extension of space, but the passage of time which are bent. What does this mean? Well, let me give you a simple picture of that. So, uh, take a clock and take another one, and they uh, make sure they indicate the same time. They do. Okay. Now, lower one, keep it lower for a while, wait a moment, then bring it up. Look at them closely, and if they're good enough clocks, these are not good enough clocks, this is my <laughs> grandfather, but if these are good enough clocks, they don't indicate the same time. The one who has been lower is late with respect to the one that has been up, which means the times go slower here and, and upper here. This is, uh, this is something Einstein understood 100 years ago, but now it's not some strange idea of Einstein. It's something which is verified in the laboratory pretty easily and regularly, even at few uh, half a meter of, 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 uh, of um. so time doesn't pass the same. Time passes slower, down, faster here. If you think a moment, the reason, the actual reason for which things fall, okay, they don't go straight, they, they come down, is because time passes a different speed up here than here. 
So it's more convenient time-wise to go up and down rather than go this way. Which, if you think, is the same reason for which you, when you fly from London to New York, and if you look at the map, you have a map of the Earth, right? And here's London, here's New York. And then you look at what the airplane does, it does that. So why the stupid pilot goes always up there? Well, because the Earth is round. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna <laughs> wanna go from east to west, it's convenient to go north because the distance between the west uh, uh, meridians is smaller north. So this is actually shorter than this. The same reason for which this is shorter than this. Space-time is curved, so it's convenient to go up and down <coughs> rather than go straight. And this is a, the hardest part of the story, so if you haven't got this time thing, it's just retain the idea that space and time are curved. Okay, so here we are after 1915, Albert Einstein, the German. Uh, this is our world now. There is a um, gravitational field, um, there is electromagnetic field, and there are particles. And there's no space and time anymore. Space and time are just uh, uh, one of the fields. Okay, but that's not the end of the story because uh, the same years uh, and, and, and shortly after, quantum mechanics comes in. In fact, Einstein himself was the origin of it, and then uh, um, Werner Heisenberg and Paul Dirac, another British, uh, probably the greatest scientist of the 20th century after, I, uh, after Einstein, Paul Dirac, who is the one who put order in quantum mechanics and wrote all the fundamental equation of the theory. So what qu quantum mechanics says? Well, roughly quantum mechanics says that this, um, these particles are not what we usually think particles are. Uh, the world is indeed made by particles, but these particles are not stones, are uh, quantum object. And what is a quantum object? Quantum object is a, is a thing that can, uh, uh, that don't exist through time in a sense. It jumps from place to place. It flickers through space-time or through the other uh, fields uh, and uh, it uh, jumps probabilistically. So it's neither determined uh, in its motion, you don't know where it's going to go tomorrow, you know only probabilistic where it's going to go tomorrow, nor always existing, sort of exists here and then here and, and there. And you can imagine the, the particles, the, the particle elementary particle physicists, you know, when they talk about electrons, they're not really stones. They're just fuzzy, teeny, flickering things jumping around. And vice versa, the field, like the magnetic field, is, has the same property. It's made by zillions of little particles flickering around. So the electromagnetic field is, the particles of the electromagnetic field are called the photons course. So the photons, the field, is, has a particle structure, if you look at very into small, uh, and the particle have a sort of field-like structure because they jump all over probabilistic everywhere. And the thing, I, I was trying to be able to produce an idea, something similar. What is the most similar object that we have in our experience that we like, which is like that? And the only thing that came about is um, vapor. Okay, so if you think at all the little droplets here, that they come into being and disappear, I think that the closest thing in my imagination to what a set of photons making a field is. So a field is not really a continuous thing, it's just flickering, existing, and disappearance of particles. So that's quantum mechanics, there are no particles anymore. There are fields which are actually quantum fields, granular fields, um, that exist probabilistically. Um, in the gravitational field, which is space-time. But let me get to the last step, and that's the main step at which I wanted to uh, get to, and is all the work of me and many of my colleagues, which is this, if, if the, electromagnetic, the electromagnetic field is made by these photons, has this structure, this flickering structure, so is the gravitational field. So is space-time. So space-time itself is not a continuous thing, flat or curving or stretching or what, whatever you want, but it has a thin structure, which is granular. It's a minimal length where this granular structure comes in, and that's what the theory of quantum gravity describes. In particular, the theory on which we work is loop quantum gravity, which describes this thin structure of space-time. You see, this is also, also this, um, this fabric is a structure, right? It's little threads. So in fact, it's not continuous. It's the little threads that they weave together to make space-time. So similarly, real space-time in which we live is a field, so it can move, can bend, can go this way or this way and, 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 and join, 
But if you look in the small, it has a granular structure. It has a loop-like structure. It's, it's weaved by thin, flickering things that exist and don't exist, uh, which are space-time. So at the end, all the picture of Newton, the solid uh, uh, space, the solid particle, has totally disappeared. There's only one remaining object, which is a quantum field, which exists over itself whose manifestations are space, time, particles, light, radio waves, everything, everything else. The picture of the reality is completely far away, completely different from this. This, this is the cl closest thing I can, can imagine about it. Where have the um, particles, the space, the time of Newton gone? And where is the concreteness of our experience of the world, the solid table? Uh, the enduring aspect of reality of which we are, um, we have the habit. I think that the person who have uh, answered this um, question best is the other great British man I mentioned at the beginning, and uh, who answer uh, this question saying in a uh, uh, couple of verses that I, I'm sure you know all very well, they all melted into air, into thin air. And, and uh, pardon my horrible Italian accent and Italian reading, like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yeah, all which it, in it inherit shall dissolve. In fact, hath dissolved, according to the picture of reality that contemporary physics is given us. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, our little life is rounded with sleep. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>